The following is a co-production of KQED and the Center for Investigative Reporting. In California's fields, things are changing. Crops are less plentiful. We're seeing two-thirds of a reduction in volume out of our southern growing regions. Insects are more abundant. Our temperatures have increased by two to three degrees Fahrenheit, and that seems to be enough to keep them from being frozen out during the winter. I did end up losing one field. Probably a quarter million dollar hit. Water, already scarce, is now too salty to sustain crops. If you don't have enough quality water to farm, then, then there's limits to what we can do with genetics. Coming up, climate change pushes California growers to new limits. Here in California, we've come to expect perfect yet affordable produce at the supermarket. And yet, the circumstances of warmer temperatures and less water just might force us to change those expectations. Hello, I'm Craig Miller, and welcome to a special broadcast of Heat and Harvest. In the next half hour, we'll look at the ways in which climate change is reshaping California's $31 billion agricultural industry. And we start with Mark Shapiro, who investigates why one of California's favorite crops is in trouble. I'm heading to the San Joaquin Valley, capital of California cherries. Cherries are part of the lore here, and not just the lore. They're a $200 million a year business. Under the right conditions, cherry orchards like this one can produce nearly three tons of juicy cherries per acre. But scientists and growers have noticed that the odds of having a good crop seem to be changing. That, that started off this way, but... Jeff Colombini's family has been farming cherries for three generations. Biting into a fresh cherry, there's no other experience like that on earth, in my opinion. Now, if you look over here... But Colombini is worried. You've got, on the lower part of the tree, you've got leaves that are out already. You've got blooms that are done blooming. Instead of coming in all at once, the blossoms are coming in stages, or not at all. You've got flowers that are just opening and at the very top leaves that are just starting to, to come out, I mean, it's just a very sporadic bloom. Sporadic blooming is a classic sign that a cherry crop is in trouble. Cherries need to hibernate below 45 degrees over a sustained period of time. Farmers call that chilling hours. When a cherry tree doesn't receive enough chilling, it's a, it's a big problem for the production of cherries because when they break dormancy, the flower buds become imperfect. They're missing parts. And so when you don't have a perfect flower, you don't have an ability to form a cherry. What we've seen over time, over the last 30 years, is those chill hours that accumulate in the winter have been getting smaller and smaller over time, which means that the uh, successful growth of these crops are becoming more and more challenging. Lobel's research has predicted that California's cherry crop could decline by as much as 20% by 2050. Perennial crops, like trees and vines, produce some of the state's most valuable foods, nearly one-third of California's total agricultural value. But they're also particularly vulnerable to climate change. Typically, they're in the ground for 20 or 30 years. And what that means is, unlike a crop like corn that you could change out each year, you're really committing uh, over a long period of time where the climate is likely to be changing. And so you have to make much more of a long-term decision, and you have to start to think about climate change maybe more than you would if you were growing an annual crop. At the Delta Packing Company, this year's cherries are being cleaned, sorted, and packaged for markets around the world. A box like this can go for as much as $125 overseas. We're seeing probably two-thirds of a reduction in volume that we would normally see out of our southern growing regions. Right now, we're, we're running one 10-hour shift a day in the early part of the season. Typically, this time of year, we're running two 10-hour shifts, and there's a lot more volume coming through. We obviously don't have as many people working in the area right now, which is impacting families. If uh, the cherry crop is, is not producing, really all around, it's, it's going to have a pretty bad effect on the industry as a whole. Cherries, it turns out, are the canary in the climate coal mine. They're highly sensitive to changes in temperature and rainfall, which scientists say are being altered by climate change. And in 2012, there's an added twist to the story. 
Data from weather stations like this one show that while the trees did seem to get enough chill, a lack of fog may have caused the buds to overheat. Dennis Baldacci is a biometeorologist at UC Berkeley. What we're trying to do now is look at long-term climate records and new data sets from satellites to see if there's a trend in reduced fog. Uh, the idea is that if it's warmer, there's maybe less chance for the air to condensate and form fog. So more sunlight on the plants, more sunlight on the ground, and the sunlight hitting the buds of the trees will make them much warmer than, than the air temperature. And so again, the plant will experience less winter chill. While the 2012 cherry crop rebounded late in the season, farmers have been seeing the risks of unpredictable weather. In 1999, the U.S. Department of Agriculture offered crop insurance for cherries for the first time. Records show that farmers bought more policies to cover more liabilities almost every year since. There's always going to be good and bad years in agriculture. Even in the future, there'll be some good years, but those will become relatively less common, and the, what we consider now a bad year will become relatively more common. It's a gradual changing of the odds of having a good year versus a bad year. And who paid for the estimated $22 million in California cherry losses last year? We did. Taxpayers paid for over a third of that and will likely do so again in 2012, according to the USDA. California cherry growers have traditionally had a competitive advantage in the U.S. market. So the earliest cherries grown in the United States come out of California because our climate is warmer than Oregon, Washington, Michigan, New York, the other places where cherries are grown. The market price for sweet cherries very early in the season is very, very high, and we're marketing cherries into that window when there's virtually no other competition from other cherry-producing areas. But now, Grant says, California's moderate climate may be getting too warm, and cherries could become unsustainable. Breeders are trying to forestall that day with varieties that need less chilling, but it's been slow going. Zager's genetics is a forerunner in devising new varieties to adapt to California's changing climate. Biologist Floyd Zager is famous for creating the pluot, a cross between a plum and an apricot. As a young man, he also started working on a low chill cherry. Approximately 50 years ago, he brought in an early blooming cherry. I believe it came from Spain, because that's a little before my time. And um, we just started working up from there. That first cherry from Spain was probably the size of a pencil eraser. His daughter is continuing his work, and they're getting closer to a commercially viable variety. But time is running out, and ultimately they're constrained by the genetics of the fruit. Within limits, we can breed new varieties that may be adapted to this kind of environment. Within limits. Beyond that range, uh, we're, we're done. Temperature is just one way in which California's changing climate will dictate whether growers have a good year or a bad year. Another equally crucial factor will be water. And not just how much water is available for farming. That will be an issue, of course. But there's another growing concern. Once again, let's join Mark Shapiro on the road in the San Joaquin Valley. Near Wesley, California, the almond orchard stretch as far as the eye can see. But scattered among the acres of healthy green trees are some that look yellow and burned. The culprit? Salt, says almond farmer Bharat Bisabri. The salt is getting into the tree, and the, the first impact starts showing on the growing tips. And you can see almost like you had put a torch through the bottom portion of these trees. It is basically killing it from there and then coming back. 63 acres of Bisabri's almond trees have been poisoned by exposure to salt. Salt prevents the tree's roots from absorbing nutrients from the soil and kills the leaves. Typically, Basabri's trees would produce 2,400 pounds of almonds per acre. But in a salt-affected orchard, yields are down by a third, eliminating its profit margin. And the almonds they do produce are small and stunted. Basically, that is uh, how a normal nut looks like, and this is one that is uh, impacted. The west side of the San Joaquin Valley is astoundingly productive farmland. The valley as a whole produces half the world's almonds. But now salt poses an increasingly serious threat to crops as water supplies dwindle. At a salt conference in Fresno, I caught up with Daniel Kozad. 
head of the Central Valley Salinity Coalition. The west side has the detriment of being a former marine deposit. It was at one time under the ocean, and so it brings with it in its soils salt already. There's no outlet for those salts. There's no drain for those salts to go back to the ocean. And as the salts build up in the soils, they eventually can get to the groundwater. Traditionally, farmers dealt with salt by irrigating with large amounts of water to leach the salt in the soil away from the roots. But competition for water has forced many farmers to go to more efficient ways to irrigate. No one would ever speak against water conservation. It's absolutely what we need to do. As farmers go to more water efficient irrigation practices, from a salinity management perspective, it increases the problem. And some experts say it's getting worse with climate change. With the climate change, sea level is on the rise. Francis Chung studies the vulnerability of the state's water system to the changing climate. We're not talking about in the future sea level is going to rise. We're talking about almost historical fact that it has risen already. He says that rising sea levels will mean less water available for everyone, notably farmers in the Central Valley. Here's why. The water used to irrigate the west side of the San Joaquin Valley comes from the north, where most of the state's rainfall takes place. It comes down the Sacramento River, passes through the Delta, and is pumped by the Federal Water Project to supply farms in the Central Valley and cities in the south. But before the water leaves the Delta, it's used for something else. The Delta is a seawater estuary where the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers converge. To keep the Delta from becoming too salty, some of the precious fresh water is used to push the seawater back toward San Francisco Bay. And as sea levels rise due to climate change, more fresh water is needed to protect the Delta. Chung says that for each foot of sea level rise, the state will need to release another 200,000 acre feet of fresh water. That extra fresh water, if, it, if not used to repel the sea salt intrusion, would have been used for municipal, industrial, agricultural purposes. But repulsing the salt is sort of like number one priority to protect all the other water uses that I just mentioned. A recent report from the National Research Council predicts that sea levels will rise in the San Francisco Bay by as much as 18 inches in the next 40 years. To protect the water quality, we are sacrificing water quantity. Bears Musikian is a melon farmer near Los Banos. We do this all day long, we taste, <laughs> preferably in See the morning. See if it's coming up, yeah. <laughs> and like that. Uh -huh. Yeah? Whoa. Good? That's terrible. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just terrible. It's terrible. It's great. Terrible. That's the worst <laughs> no, cantaloupe in the whole valley. <laughs> Musikian's total reliance on irrigated delta water creates high uncertainty year after year. The primary concern is the water is becoming so expensive and it's so restrictive, it's not even physically available, that um, we won't be able to continue. To cope, Musiki and Fallows land, usually about a third of his acreage. Across the west side, more than 100,000 acres were fallowed in 2012 due to lack of water. Farmers are being forced to adapt. Last year we did a series of trials on pistachio rootstocks to isolate four or five clonal lines that were just extraordinary at high salt concentrations in vitro. This high-tech laboratory is run by the largest plant nursery in California. Owner John Duarte says that he's been hearing reports from farmers about their problems with salt in the fields. He's trying to devise a response. Lab workers here are using a high-speed breeding method to test for salt tolerance. Here in the Central Valley, there's huge opportunities for agriculture. It's pushing growers through land scarcity. It's pushing growers into more marginal areas of land and more marginal water sources. In those areas, when they order rootstocks and trees and vines from us, they're going to want rootstocks that are tolerant to salts, that are fairly drought tolerant. They want roots that forge deep into the ground and um, sustain the tree through drier times and hotter weather. And so we see salt tolerance and drought tolerance is really core factors for developing the genetics for the next couple generations of farming. Urgent efforts like these are underway at nurseries and universities across the region, what Duarte calls the Silicon Valley of agricultural innovation. When those growers don't get supplied with the freshwater resources they need out of the delta, they then have to go to groundwater wells. That water is generally very expensive, it's very deep, 
It takes a lot of electricity to lift it, and it's also a very low quality. We can help the grower deal with that to some extent, but if you don't have enough quality water to farm, then, then there's limits to what we can do with genetics. Back at the Shiraz Ranch, Bharat Basabri tried to do just that. He spent $30,000 to upgrade an irrigation well. Then, in 2009, after three years of drought, his real problems began. Water was in drastically short supply. We got only 10% of the allocation. And what we did was we started the well that we have and we irrigated this orchard with that well. The well brought up tainted water, much too salty to use. But he had no options and used it anyway. It didn't work. Every trick that I know I've done to these trees and they won't respond anymore. So now we're going to come with the bulldozers and take the trees out of here and grind them up and send them to the incinerator and start over. One of the first things he plans to do is buy a new variety of more salt-tolerant almond tree. And he hopes that more rain will wash the salt from his soil. But if that doesn't happen, he's in trouble. I'm hoping that, uh, as I said, some of those assumptions will not come true whether it is on the climate change itself or when the impact of the climate change and its impact on the west side. Climate change and water security are reaching the highest levels of government. Governor Jerry Brown has announced a costly plan to modernize the Delta, in part, he says, to address the threat of climate change to the water supply. Two massive tunnels would bypass the Delta to channel fresh water directly to farms and cities in Southern California. Uh, we have farmers, we have fish, we have environmentalists, we have citizens, and we got to all make it work somehow. He says the plan would help farmers get the water they need and avoid the salty groundwater. The chances of it being built in the next decade or so are slim. So what am I going to do if I don't do this? If I get out of farming, then I go to do what? As if the challenges of a hotter, drier growing climate aren't enough, California farmers are now having to contend with a new climate-driven threat, more bugs in their fields. Growers and scientists have discovered that pests that never used to pose a serious threat are now making themselves right at home in among valuable crops. In California's Cuyama Valley, an hour southwest of Bakersfield, an unwelcome visitor lurks in the potato fields. Yep, that is a nymph. That one is active. Grower Brian Kirschenman and his crew are looking for tiny pests called potato tomato psyllids. The insects, both the young nymphs and the adults, are as small as the comma on a computer keyboard. But they wreak havoc on potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, 40 crops in all. In potatoes, they suck the plant dry. And what's worse, the pest can also transmit a disease that ruins potato chips. Despite the bad rap they get from nutritionists, potato chips are a $6 billion business. When infected potatoes are fried, dark streaks appear on them, which is why this disease has been dubbed zebra chip. I visited entomologist John Trumbull at the University of California, Riverside, for a private tasting. Some of them come out with wonderful patterns, <laughs> but unfortunately what's happened is instead of starch, they have sugar in the vascular system, and when you cook that, it turns it brown, and the consumers send it back. Yeah, a little burnt tasting. As a result, they've lost many millions of dollars in Texas, California, and Washington State. Are you finding nymphs or adults? Kirschenman grows thousands of acres of potatoes here and in neighboring Kern County, where the crop is one of the county's top 10 in value. 
Kirschenman was the first California grower to find zebra chip disease in his potatoes in 2008. I did end up losing one field and um, tried everything to make it work. And it was, I got to a point of just saying, move on. It was a, probably a quarter million dollar hit. California has had these psyllids for more than 100 years. What makes them a new problem for growers is that now they don't just live here during the warmer months, they also spend the winter. Our temperatures have increased by two to three degrees Fahrenheit, and that seems to be enough to keep them from being frozen out during the winter or chilled out during the winter. I suspect that global warming is at least playing a role in this particular insect spread into California. Around the world, scientists are observing similar changes. In Spain, the European grapevine moth is flying out earlier in the summer and reproducing more abundantly than it did 20 years ago. On Tanzania's Mount Kilimanjaro, malaria mosquitoes are moving farther up the mountain. And in Japan, a pest called the green stink bug that damages rice and soybeans is expanding its range northward. This is not speculative. This is not uh, something that we would predict. This is what's happening now. But how did Trumbull know he was seeing something new? His detective work began in Irvine on one of his test fields for tomatoes. So this was the scene of the crime, so to speak. And this is the very field where we discovered the psyllids were overwintering. Back in 2000, when he discovered that psyllids had spent the winter near this field, Trumbull knew it was bad news. OK, what do you got? One adult. It meant the pest could begin attacking crops early in the growing season. When a grower puts in their crops, they're already there. And that means it's much more dangerous for the grower because early infestation in a crop oftentimes leads to much more damage than if they occur late in the crop. Through historical records, he concluded that this was the first time the psyllid had overwintered in California. Every 30 years since about 1900, it's moved into California. And we would find it, it would be here for six months, it would be here for a year, and then it would disappear, presumably because it got too cold. That pattern changed radically in 2000, with the psyllids spending the winter in Irvine. Then in 2004, tomato growers discovered the pest had overwintered in Hollister. In 2012, in the Washington, Oregon, Idaho area, where half the nation's potatoes are grown. And that same year, it appeared in Manitoba, Canada, early in the growing season. Meanwhile, down south, a farmer's worst nightmare had already materialized. In Mexico's Baja, California, psyllids destroyed 85% of the tomato crop in 2001. It's mid-July, and Kirschenman is preparing for the harvest. This is the moment of truth, when he'll find out if his potatoes were infected with zebra chip or spared. The potato grows from a potato. So as for potato seed, it's, your, it's very important to have the cleanest of all clean seed you can. These are nice. There's zero issues in these. But Kirschenman is concerned about other possible repercussions. The seed is grown for, um, for Central America. These go down to Guatemala and the Dominican Republic. So if this becomes a bigger issue and countries want to um, stop importing potatoes because they found a zebra chip, or that's my biggest fear. In fact, just a month later, South Korea banned all potato imports from Washington, Oregon, and Idaho out of concern over zebra chip disease. The ban is costing producers some $8 million. The field where Kirschenman had found psyllids turned out to be lightly infected with zebra chip. So keeping psyllids out of his fields is now more urgent than ever. Spraying for psyllids increases California potato growers' costs by about $75 an acre. Back at UC Riverside, researchers like Sean Prager are looking for an alternative to heavy spraying. Their goal is to keep the psyllids from feeding on crops by dousing plants with smelly oils or covering their leaves with clay. As soon as they start eating, they run the risk of transmitting a disease. So if you can avoid them feeding at all, that's a far more elegant solution than having to kill them every time you see some psyllids in the field. 
Since the 1970s, scientists and growers in California have dramatically reduced pesticide use in many conventionally grown crops. Tomato growers, for example, cut spraying by half in the 1990s. There are huge advantages to the people in California. Less pesticide use means less concern by the consumers for pesticide residue. We use less fossil fuels. We have fewer volatile organic compounds that appear in the atmosphere. It reduces smog. It's, it's a real win-win-win for everybody in California. But warmer temperatures and the pests that thrive in them now threaten to undermine these gains. So if you have an insect with multiple generations, you get more generations. If you get an insect that occurs early in a crop, it will occur earlier in the crop and faster. So all of these things are desperately in need of additional research. Scientists like John Trumbull are already working with growers to confront the many challenges that climate change is throwing at them. But these solutions won't come cheap, whether it's coming up with a cherry that tolerates warmer temperatures or just better ways of keeping the bugs at bay. Every option comes with a price tag, and sooner or later, that could mean higher prices at the supermarket. There's much more online at our website, kqed.org slash heat and harvest, where you can also hear my radio report on what growers are doing to confront the water challenge.